These are the Great Lakes, Huron, Ontario, Michigan, Erie, and Superior, that border eight American states and one Canadian province, and are home to more than 30 million people and 3,500 different plant and animal species. The Great Lakes provide the Midwest with fresh drinking water, a sustainable food source, a hotspot for tourism, thousands of coastal jobs, and ultimately, this way of life. Spending hours on the water, watching sunsets on the beach, shopping downtown, and walking across the Mackinac Bridge on Labor Day is at the heart of what reels in 113.4 million visitors to the state of Michigan. Roughly $2 billion comes from tourism, with almost half of that being spent on the coasts of the Michigan state. The Great Lakes economy is not only reliant on tourism, but also fishing and boating. The lakes serve as a crucial shipping channel that connects the Midwest to the rest of the world. In 2017, the Great Lakes hooked $3.9 billion in recreational boating and $2 billion in recreational fishing. The lakes supply a total of 525,886 jobs for the state of Michigan and 1.5 million careers on the coast. But this natural resource that has given this way of life to the Great Lakes region is navigating waves of change and is now on the brink. The Great Lakes make up 21% of the fresh water right here on Earth. That's 3% of the world's fresh water supply. This means the Midwest is sitting on top of one of the largest sources of life itself. But what exactly is pushing the Great Lakes to the brink? In this special, we will dive deeper into the many challenges the lakes are facing at this very moment and what that means for you. Natural phenomenon, man-made threats, and controversy are making waves in this six quadrillion gallon force. This is Great Lakes on the Brink. The coastal lifestyle can be one of beauty and leisure. But what if it was all washed away by the very resource it depends on? One town in particular has been left defenseless and some residents struggle to save their homes from these rising water levels. But that threat isn't confined to just one community. Petoskey, a hotspot for tourists and an undisputed beauty for residents, is just one of many cities located on the Great Lakes. Kendall Kinglesmith translates his love for the Petoskey way of life through his work as the director of the city's Parks and Recreation Department. But lately, he's met with a new challenge. It's frustrating, man. Yeah, I'm telling you. The culprit for this rising frustration, rising water levels. Well, I'm not going to lie. You panic a little bit because this is the highest the water's been in 30, 30 some years. And Petoskey is suffering damages lying right in the wake of this unforgiving force of nature that is showing no signs of slowing down. It happened quick. Just this morning, right here in Petoskey, these high water levels reached this barrier here and took out ground. Now this ground that has been taken out is just feet away from this playground. If we can't operate our marina, I mean, that's huge. The higher these water levels get, the murkier the city's future becomes. The coastal lifestyle is in danger of washing out. It isn't isolated to one spot. Right. And, it's, and it is a massive undertaking. In fact, all five Great Lakes have hit record highs in the past year and are expected to only climb further in the coming seasons. As of the beginning of November, Lake Superior was 16 inches above its long-term monthly average. The waters of Lake Ontario reached 19 inches higher. Lake Erie challenged its norm by 28 inches. And as for the connecting lakes, Huron and Michigan rested at 36 inches above their long-term monthly average. The true cause that gives rise to these water levels is elusive, but certain suspected factors impact many communities. I know Petoskey isn't the only coastal town that's dealing with us. In many coastal communities, high water levels have washed away roads, consumed inland bodies of water, and have flooded valuable properties. I mean, it's all kind of new to everybody. So certainly the public is, I mean, they're curious and they're concerned. Concerned with the uncertainty of their tourism-based economies as visitors turn away from shrinking beaches and waterlogged piers and boat launches. The compromised areas need to be addressed now. Water levels are a hard phenomenon to predict, and the many problems that they cause have limited solutions. The Parks and Rec Department has utilized boulders and sandbags in an attempt to keep the water at bay, an operation costing them tens of thousands of dollars. You hope that the costs are, are manageable, because um, if they're not, I mean, I don't know what you do. But 
their hard work so far has only been met with intense uncertainty. Mother Nature is undefeated, so whatever's gonna, whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen. Rebecca Allen, DTV News. So why are the Great Lakes water levels so high? The first step to answering this question is by looking at climate, weather, and the natural cycle of the lakes. The lakes have a cycle where the level of the water rises and falls almost every 20 years. But what does this mean for water levels? Jeff Lutz, a general forecaster at the U.S. National Weather Service in Gaylord, Michigan, explains how the weather, in fact, does affect the Great Lakes. The weather <laughs> does affect the level of the Great Lakes. Um, several years ago, we noted that there was, uh, if you may remember, there was ice cover over a, a good portion of the Great Lakes. With that, then we don't get as much evaporation of the Great Lakes during the winter and into the spring. The ice just kind of hung on as long as it could. And then we also then had rain over the uh, subsequent years uh, that was probably somewhat above normal in the Great Lakes Basin. So that helps to feed into everything. Now the Great Lakes itself goes through a cycle of every about 10 to 20 years, I think, where it rises and falls and rises and falls. And we've seen that uh, over the time period up here as well. And so that's another part of it where just there's a climatological cycle that goes on with the Great Lakes. Earth's atmosphere is 1.78 degrees warmer than its long-term average, meaning everything else on Earth also warms, including our water. A recent study conducted found that lakes have warmed, on average, 2.5 degrees Fahrenheit since the 1980s. Climate is the weather conditions prevailing in an area over a long period of time. On the other hand, weather itself describes the state of the atmosphere on a day-to-day -day basis. Ultimately, changes in climate will affect weather patterns. Climate change can influence severe weather by causing longer droughts and higher temperatures. With the weather warming due to climate change, it heats up water, which can cause bigger rain, snow, or even thunderstorms, which in turn could increase water levels. It is hard to see the changes on a day-to-day -day basis like a weather pattern, but in the long run, climate change will have an effect on weather and the Great Lakes. While some threats to the Great Lakes stem from the atmosphere, others have been placed here by humans. What if an essential tool for a booming industry is turning into a catalyst for controversy and for concern? The Straits of Mackinac is one of the most iconic and picturesque locations in Michigan. But this gem covers up a hiding place of one of the biggest controversies in the Great Lakes. Beneath the clear tides lurks the source of a legal battle between Michigan and a corporation. The source? Line 5. Line 5 is a 645 mile long oil and natural gas pipeline that runs from northern Wisconsin through the heart of Michigan all the way to Sarnia, Ontario, pumping 23 million gallons of light crude oil and natural gas liquids daily. Line 5 factors into almost every Michigander's daily life in one way or another. Line 5 really does play a key role in Michigan in providing Michigan with energy. So it, it supplies 65% of the propane people use in the UP, 55% of the propane used uh, statewide, 30% of the oil on Line 5 goes to Detroit area refineries to be used back in Michigan. So people uh, use it um, in their cars, it's used for the jet fuel at the Detroit airport. It's used to make thousands of different products. This pipeline, constructed by a Canadian-based company called Enbridge, has been the target of recent criticism because of the pipeline's placement right through the economically and environmentally significant Straits of Mackinac. The location of Line 5 has been identified by the scientists at the University of Michigan as the worst possible place for an oil spill. Liz Kirkwood, the executive director of the Environmental Group for Love of Water, or FLOW, has been pursuing the shutdown of Line 5 for years and counting. The state has a legal duty to protect the Great Lakes over protecting a private oil pipeline company like Enbridge. Concern over the 65-year-old pipeline has grown recently, primarily because of a 12,000-pound anchor strike on the line that left it dented and marred. This has caused worries of a potential break that would cause a catastrophic oil spill. We were extraordinarily lucky that we did not experience a complete rupture of Line 5 because if we did, we would be cleaning up the Great Lakes and our shorelines for the rest of our lives and possibly the lives of our children as well. If the line breaks, it would be detrimental to Michigan's tourism and fishing industries as well as affect the lives of the people at home who get their drinking water from the lakes. Shutting down the line would cause immediate and widespread change in Michigan's production and economy. 
Because oil would then have to be transported by rail, tanker, or truck, shipping costs would increase, causing gas prices to go up and make products harder to manufacture. Enbridge has proposed a solution to protect the pipelines that comes as a large concrete tunnel built around the line. We feel like that really is the best solution for Line 5 going forward because it makes sure that the line continues to provide the energy that Michigan needs, but at the same time it does further protect the Straits and protect the Great Lakes because the line would be in a, in a tunnel with foot thick concrete walls 100 feet below the lake bed there and so it would be fully protected. The chance of any kind of product ever getting out is almost zero. This plan was approved by former Michigan Governor Rick Snyder, however is now facing pushback from the highest state officials who believe they have a duty to preserve the state and the Great Lakes. I'm upholding that responsibility by filing a lawsuit in Ingham County Circuit Court to take the first step to decommission the 66-year-old dual pipelines that run through the Straits of Mackinac. Michigan Attorney General Dana Nessel, as well as State Governor Gretchen Whitmer, have been very outspoken in their opposition to the tunnel project. Nessel holds a strong belief that Ed Bridges' track record provides even more of a reason to close the line. And the oil spill in Kalamazoo that cost more than $700 million and left permanent damage to the affected areas. This incident happened back in 2010 when a pipeline that Enbridge operated burst, spilling over 1 million gallons of oil into the Kalamazoo River and surrounding areas, a crisis that became one of the biggest inland oil spills in U.S. history. As the battle rages on in the courts and in the streets, there remains an ever-present fear of a disastrous oil spill that would soil Michigan's Great Lakes and shorelines, provoking a heavy question that is being asked more and more around the world. In the battle of the environment versus capitalism, who will prevail? Haley Croft, DTV News. The Line 5 pipeline is not the only threat of pollution to the lakes. Partially treated sewage is finding its way into every ounce of valuable water. Partially treated sewage is released into our rivers and lakes when municipal sewer systems overflow after a storm. This waste includes runoff sewer water along with human waste, which is treated at the same water plants. Bigger storms are causing treatment facilities to overload water treatment facilities and release partially treated sewage back into the water and rivers before sewage backups happen. It is a cycle that happens too often, and some facilities have had major spills. Back in August, a flash flood in Flint, Michigan caused a primary settling tank at a wastewater treatment plant to overflow, sending 2 million gallons of raw waste onto the ground and into a storm sewer drain that discharges directly to the Flint River. These sewage spills and intentional dumps are a big factor to the pollution of our Great Lakes. The Great Lakes have always been a great place for friends and family to gather, but a green sheen has been taking over one lake in particular, and because of that, lake life as we know it has begun to die. No, no one's here. No one's on the water. Summers on Lake Erie are meant for fun with family on a boat or swimming, but now when you touch the water, we're definitely going to wash our hands when we get inside. Things have since changed. This is Kelly Jacobs, a homeowner on Lake Erie and the mom of a four-year-old son who is partly the reason for buying a lake house. So we can't have little ones, you know, you can't go swimming in it. Probably really shouldn't be on, you know, jet skis, fishing. We have great walleye around here, but you're not going to want to catch and eat it. Actually, this summer we sold our kayaks just because we knew we couldn't use them. At the height of every summer, these giant algae blooms sprout out and make it impossible to teach your son how to swim. Ricky Becker, a professor at the University of Toledo, is studying these algae blooms. Powered by fertilizer that runs off from farmers' fields into the watershed, the algal bloom this year in Lake Erie grew to over 700 square miles, making it one of the worst blooms yet. It's green for starting, and then you also see there's a little bit of scum forming on the top, and that is the blue-green algae we're talking about. So we're talking about blue-green algae. That's the, so potentially the algae that would be producing a toxin. And so that would be a warning sign that if you're here, you would not want to swim, you'd not want to be in this water uh, without knowing for sure what it is. And so that, that, that scum forming at the top is, is the algae coming up to the top uh, and just sitting there. The primary uh, source of the nutrients of phosphorus and nitrogen uh, are from runoff from farm fields and so that's entering into the lake and we put fertilizer on the farm fields to make the plants grow. Unfortunately, algae are also plants and they grow well when they respond to that fertilizer. But this plant is also toxic. As it sits in blooms, toxins are getting dumped into the lake, which makes it dangerous to use the water. We've had different years with different magnitudes and so worst is, is kind of hard to define because worst can be largest, worst can be most toxic. And that is exactly what happened in 2014. Toledo had a major water crisis from this algae bloom. 
500,000 water taps had been shut off for weeks after the findings of toxins at the city's water plant. Civilians have been told not to drink, brush their teeth, cook, or give their pets this water. This crisis has brought into the light the dangers of algae blooms for the people. If there are microcysts in the water and, the, and, and your dog drinks that water, it, it'll be fatal. And so uh, more and more, public, the public outcry, the public demands uh, is for, uh, let's solve this problem. But to solve this problem is more than some are willing to do. Three million dollars have been put into the water treatment plant, but tens of millions of dollars have been lost in the economy. And the people can't do it alone. They need the help of the government, farmers, and scientists to bring the end of these horrible blooms. As for the Jacobs family, they have moved away from the lake, but this isn't over for the many more who still live there. It's a great place to live. We just need to find a solution to the algae blooms. Emily Fronte, DTV News. While some living organisms like algae are challenging fragile ecosystems, some factors, while not alive, are created by man. When you think about the water you're consuming, swimming, and boating in, you may not be thinking about consuming plastics and hazardous chemicals. Still 22 million pounds of microplastic plague our Great Lakes. Microplastics come from cosmetic products, clothes, water bottles breaking down over time, and many other everyday objects. Then these pieces, no bigger than five millimeters, make their way into the water. If that wasn't bad enough, they also absorb chemicals from heavy industry, fertilizers, and manufacturing before they make it into the water. These toxins, then on their Trojan horse, move up the food chain as fish mistake them for food, and we mistake those fish as safe to eat. Bacteria such as E. coli caused by a presence of animal feces also nest in these plastics, with certain strains causing diarrhea or kidney failure. However, that's not the worst of it. Other harmful chemicals found in cigarettes, herbicide, paper bleaching, pesticides, electrical equipment, and flame retardants also absorb into the hard shell, many of which are associated with miscarriage, cancer, and even death. While pollution is a growing concern, a natural living polluter is honing in on the lakes. These invaders can cause damage to pre-existing life and are forcing action to be taken before an entire ecosystem is devoured. Uh, being skittish and easily spooked by even the sound of a motor, they'll leap out of the water and have been known to um, injure people. Of the 180 invasive species now threatening the Great Lakes, the Asian carp are making the biggest splash. They're growing and spreading like wildfire. Uh, they become the dominant biomass in those systems. Uh, they can reproduce like mad, grow to enormous sizes, eat uh, the ecosystems um, out of house and home. Fish are not the only species that threaten the Great Lakes. Plants such as frogbit and purple loosestrife had planted their roots. Among the Asian carp, scientists are also worried about other species such as zebra and quagga mussels. They have spread through the lakes and grass carp have already swam their way into Lake Erie. Another pest infecting the Great Lakes are sea lamprey. They are a parasitic fish that are so deadly to the native fish of the Great Lakes that they are in direct competition with human fishing. Those are puncture marks from 60 pounds of suction per square inch, uh, the teeth drawing into your hand like that. They attach themselves directly to fish bore a hole through the fish with a sharp tongue and feed it on the fish's blood and body fluids. They've caused irreparable harm uh, to the food web. Because of the measures scientists, lawmakers, and everyday people take to keep these destructive creatures back, the number of invasive species have decreased from its all-time high in 1993. For years, the solution of keeping the carp at bay has been simply fishing them out, but it might not be enough anymore. Scientists and engineers are working on converting a lock south of Chicago into a custom carp barrier. Includes an engineered channel, so this area here in orange represents the engineered channel, which is uh, downstream of the lock here. And uh, then we'd have an electric barrier, uh, some acoustics, and an air bubble curtain here to uh, discourage uh, fish from coming in with uh, barges and so forth. Uh, the electric barrier would uh, prevent uh, those fish from coming up here into this uh, chamber. Project so manager have, uh, Andrew Lichty at United well, States Army Corps of Engineers knows just how much trouble the Great Lakes could be in. So this is uh, very important to the protection of the Great Lakes. This $700 million plan has been sent to Congress for funding, but so far the money has not been granted. If the money comes through, it could take up to 12 years to finish designing and building this massive project. And even if the barrier is built, it might not keep every fish out. Uh, we're fairly confident if, if we can have that layered system, all the measures put together, so you know, there's still a, a slight risk that they, they could get through. With this new barrier system in place, we might be able to stop the growing and spreading of the destructive carp. 
that will continue to threaten the Great Lakes, possibly destroying their fragile ecosystems as we know them. Morgan Welch, DTV News. We've talked about issues with the Great Lakes, but waters everywhere are troubled and people all around the world suffer at the expense. There are a few cities in the United States that have lead in their tap water. Four of those cities are right here in Michigan, Essexville, Lapeer, Detroit, and Flint. And our neighbors to the north are also facing problems with lead in their water. A recently released report indicates that several cities in Canada have more lead in their water than Flint ever did. Most of these lead issues are due to the aging infrastructure, and several states around the country have the worst public water ratings due to pollution and natural disasters. As we take a look across the globe, some countries have almost no water at all. 36 countries have very scarce water. Most of them are in the area of Asia. People in Uganda have to travel more than 30 minutes just to have access to safe drinking water. Coastal cities are being flooded due to the rise of sea levels. People in the Alaskan city of Newtok had to literally move their town because their homes are eroding away right before their eyes. And the historic city of Venice, Italy is six feet underwater. The water levels are the highest they've been in 50 years, thanks to rising sea levels. With the, all the problems in the water, the future is looking murky. Water is absolutely essential, but it's a force that is falling victim to many challenges, both natural and man-made, all over the world. Though some elements are out of our hands, other factors aren't. It's important that we respond in the best way we can to all happenings surrounding our fresh water. Educate yourself and others. Be aware of how your actions and the actions of your neighbors are affecting our water. Become an advocate for healthy water and prospering lakes. The future of the Great Lakes isn't certain, but it isn't lost forever either. And that's why Great Lakes don't have to be on the brink.